Again, a big welcome to everyone who's calling in on Zoom and welcome to this next edition of Christine and Guests, which is our speaker series at Thought for Food where I invite amazing people from my professional network to come and chat about food and agriculture, innovation frontiers, and the future that we are trying to build that will lead us to you know, a more sustainable and inclusive society. So today I'm really excited to welcome our guests who are coming to talk to us about agribusiness in Brazil. Um, as we talked about in our last Christine and Guest session, um, where we were exploring sugarcane, uh, we definitely have learned that Brazil is a global powerhouse for feeding the world. So it's exciting to get some like industry players here to talk about the complexity and the richness of Brazilian agriculture and you know the role that it plays in helping to feed our planet. So it's my pleasure to welcome Marcelo Brito, who is the CEO of AgroPalma Group, the director of the Brazilian Agribusiness Association, and who was the president of the Brazilian Palm Oil Association. He's also a member of the board of directors on the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil and part of Renature's advisory team. And by the way, so am I. So that's great, Marcelo, helping to um, do as Felipe says, let's do this about you know, making uh, agroforestry mainstream. I'm also delighted to welcome Marcos Yank, who's the Senior Professor of Global Agribusiness at INSPIR. Am I saying that right, Marcos? Is it INSPIR? Yeah, correct. Perfect. Cool. Okay. And the coordinator at the Center for Inspir Agro Global. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, he was the president of the Asia Brazil Agro Alliance. ABBA, not like the band, <laughs> um, but that is an initiative that enhances the profile of the Brazilian agri-food industry in Asian economies, um, and they were based in Singapore. So I'm super excited. There's a lot of rich topics to discuss from protecting the environment through the, some of the social challenges and environmental challenges facing the sector, as well as this you know, very interesting relationship between Brazil and China and what's gonna happen in this new era of post-COVID trade. <laughs> so plenty to discuss. Before we dive in, I just wanna give one logistical point, which is um, for those of you who are watching um, through our Zoom chat, if you have questions or comments or topics you would like us to discuss, please put those straight into the Q&A or the chat. I'd love to take those. Remember the purpose of these conversations is to address tough questions, to get real. You know, we don't just wanna explore the high level stuff. We wanna get in this the next gen way, right? And have these type of real and authentic discussions. So don't be afraid to chime in. Um, and yeah, before uh, getting into the meat of this, if I could just pause and have Marcelo and Marcos introduce yourselves and share a little bit about your work and what you're hoping to chat about today. Oh, hi, Christine. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Well, I am Marcelo Brito. Uh, I've been in the food industry for many, many years, uh, over three decades. Uh, very tough job because I was in the beef industry. And I was in the palm oil industry. I was in the oils and fats. Uh, industry for long, long days. And for about two decades ago, I, I changed my curriculum and I started to call me agri-environmentalist and not an agribusiness uh, person anymore because this was when we started to bring uh, uh, new technology, innovation, and a different view for the food production uh, in Brazil and also in other uh, countries around the world. So today my main goal is, is uh, I am the head of the Brazilian Agribusiness Association and also the co-facilitator of the uh, Brazilian Coalition on Climate, uh, Forest and Agriculture. It's an initiative with over 200 uh, organizations where we try to put together uh, a holistic view of forest agriculture and climate, uh, trying to translate uh, the real meaning of sustainability in a long-term production. And also uh, not only on the production, but production, transportation, and the consumers uh, 
uh, for the consumers as well. So like a whole uh, sustainable chain. So I think for now it's okay and we come back soon with other issues. Thank you so much. Amazing. I love agri-environmentalist. I think most of us would also try to take that as our, you know, nomenclature. So super cool word. Um, how about you, Marcos? Tell us more about yourself. Yeah. Yes, and, uh, uh, good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you. I am today a professor at the INSPER, which is a very important school of economics, business, law, and engineering here in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I used to teach in other universities before, at the University of Sao Paulo, at the School of Agriculture, where I did my, my, my bachelor. I come from a farm. My father and my brothers are, are all farmers. Um, and, and I decided to move to agricultural economics. And I've been working also around 30 years in different places. So I spent uh, 18 years at the university. I spent 10 years in the private sector working as, a, as the president of the Sugarcane Industry Association here in Brazil. I work at, for BRF, Brazil Foods in Asia, and it's the expansion of this company in Asia, and you see market access in different areas. I work at also uh, uh, creating some uh, research groups in, in, in international competitiveness, food security, food safety. Actually, my, my uh, life is, is very much around this the issue of agri-food competitiveness, sustainability, uh, market access, uh, food security, food safety. And I always uh, try to understand the role of Brazil in this area. So what's, what's the new role of a tropical country like Brazil in terms of supplying commodities, agricultural commodities to the world? And I had the chance to see this, this question from different angles, being a farmer first and then in, in, in the academy. I worked two years for the government, international organizations. I lived in the US, in Europe, and in Asia. So, but always looking the same question, agri-food sustainability, agri-food competitiveness, and the role of Brazil. Well, that is a question I want to hear your answer to. So what is the role? <laughs> and is there a big trade-off between sustainability and market competitiveness? Yeah. Uh, can I start, Marcelo? Yeah. yeah, go go ahead. Okay. So I, I believe that Brazil, until the, the 90s, Brazil was a big importer of, of many commodities that, to, to, that today we are exporting. At that time, Brazil was a, a big exporter of coffee, sugarcane, you see tropical products. But then we had a tropical revolution in Brazil. So the move of agriculture from the south of Brazil to the center west of the country was an amazing process because we, we developed several te uh, uh, tropical technologies that made it possible for us, for example, to have uh, uh, two crops a year without uh, irrigation. So this, uh, we can plant, for example, soy and corn or soy and cotton in the same area, just using the rainy season. And then we had no till, Today we have uh, crop livestock integration, which is the next revolution in Brazil, a huge increase of the possibility of using pastures, degraded pastures to produce more agriculture without the need of, you see, uh, new deforestation. We also had uh, varieties of different uh, uh, commodities, for example, soybeans, corn, cotton, that were adapted to the tropical conditions. We had also the improvement of uh, African grasses, Indian cattle. So I believe that to, today, if you look at the, the, the tropical region of the world, the country that has more productivity in agriculture is Brazil, by far. Okay. There is no other country that did this. And because of that, Brazil became the second largest exporter, the, the, the third largest exporter of agri-food products, just after US and Europe and more than Australia, Canada, and other, and other countries. And, and, and the number one, number two, number three country uh, in the rank of soy, uh, corn, cotton, sugar, ethanol, uh, orange juice, and you see several other products, uh, beef, chicken, pork, you see. So it's a, it's a country that became very important, exporting to 200 other countries in the world 
very much to Asia right now, to China and to other countries in Asia. So this is the role that we have today, but for sure that we have challenges also. And one of the challenges is exactly the sustainability of, of the agricultural development in Brazil. And let me turn to you, Marcelo, our agri-environmentalist, to talk a little bit about like the, that sustainability side, because I do think that there is this perception indeed that Brazil is this powerhouse in ag, has made the transition, right, to become in, from an importer to an exporter, has really shown what can happen with industrial, you know, models and higher productivity, but at what cost, right? And is this something that you see that Brazil has also had leadership in around sustainability? Do you think it's maybe a misperception in the eyes of the world that it's been this big trade-off and that actually things have gone well? Well, Christine, that's, that's a nice question. Uh, first of all, we, we, we have to split the different agribusiness that we have in Brazil. Uh, there is a lack of knowledge about the real agri uh, Brazilian agribusiness. So when you, you look at the, at the level of properties, we have in Brazil 5.3 million uh, rural properties. 85% of that has 100 hectares or less. So this is a meaning that we're not talking about a country with huge farms that are producing this, this number of, of, of different food products, okay? The majority of the farmers are medium size. Uh, 100 hectares in Brazil, it's a small farm. Of course, it's huge in Belgium, but in Brazil, in the United States, uh, this is a small farm. It's even, uh, the average here is smaller than the average in the United States, the average in Canada, or the average in Australia. Actually, Australia, is, it's much bigger, okay? So first of all, let, let, let's understand this. Second of all, the agriculture production in Brazil is started, let's say, professionally in the south of Brazil and moved north, moved north, okay? Uh, but there are people in the world that, that believes or think that most of this production comes from the Amazon region, which is totally untrue, okay? Uh, let's look at for in soybean, for example, okay? Less than 3% of the total Brazilian soybean production comes from the Amazon region, 3%, that's it, okay? Uh, I believe, but I, I don't have this, this number for sure, Marcos can, help me later on, but I believe that much less than 20% of the total beef exported, exported by Brazil, the cattle was raised in the Amazon region. And I believe none of the chicken, uh, none of the, the, uh, the poultry and so on, okay? So it's a very diversified country, very diversified and very young as well, very young, okay? Uh, like I have friends involved in the, in the timber industry in Finland, in companies that, that are in the business for almost 400 years. Brazil has 500 years of history, Total. 500 well, years as a country. At, at all. Yeah. So, yeah, when we look at the Amazon region, the, 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 the real history of development, it started like 50 to 60 years ago, no more than that. Yeah. And when you look at this region today, you see a, a space, a, a territory that's about almost the size of, I don't know how many countries in Europe, almost all the countries in Europe. Oi. It's about, it's, excuse me, it's about the size of, of the United States or half of the United States, but yeah. you only have 25, people, 25 million people living there. Right. So when you talk about sustainability, what I can tell you that the majority, the majority of the food production in Brazil, it's very sustainable in all aspects, in all yeah. aspects. But there are still challenges to face. And as a new country, we still have to, to improve in a number of things to reach a level that we can say that 100% is coming from a sustainable source. But I'm quite positive to, to tell you today that over 90% of the, the Brazilian agribusiness 
is pretty sustainable as much as any, any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. Marcos, do you have anything to build about this, like about the trade-off between sustainability and productivity, right, and market access that, you know, you're studying? No, I, I believe that, first of all, this, this huge agricultural revolution that we had with double crop, crop livestock integration, productivity levels, the increase of total productivity, total agricultural productivity in Brazil is twice the U.S. number, two times. Brazil raises productivity around the 3 to 3.5 percent a year. If we look total productivity, labor, uh, you see capital uh, and people, uh, and the U.S. was 1.7 1, 1. percent a year. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really amazing what happened here after the 80s and 90s, when it was a, we were, were able to produce in the center west of the country. But as Marcelo said, there are several agribusiness. So there's one agribusiness that, that's full compliant to the rules and it's exporting. Because we are exporting to 200 countries, we need to have all the best sanitary conditions, all the best technologies, all the best traceability systems, animal welfare, sanitary conditions, whatever, you see? And these guys, these big guys, I mean, in terms of companies that are exporting and also producers that are compliant, these guys, they will now offer uh, deforestation and conversion free products to the world because the world wants this product. So we are seeing this movement happening today in soybeans, in companies like Cargill, Maggi, uh, Costco. We are seeing the same movement coming to cattle through JBS, Minerva, uh, Marfrig, etc. But this doesn't mean that the rest of the country will be compliant because we also have problems of the way that we did it, the occupation of the territory. Unfortunately, right. different of the US where people moved to the center west in a situation where the land tenure was already defined. In Brazil, we never had the definition of land tenure in the Amazon, for example. In the 70s, the rule of the government was go to this region to occupy. We needed to occupy to guarantee that the, that the Amazon is ours. So today we have 23 million people living in the Amazon because they were incentivized to go there. And, and the people who are doing agriculture there, many of them do not have titles today. We also have a, a recent forest code that was approved eight years ago. But unfortunately, this code was not yet fully uh, applied to the country. And that's why we have uh, what we call illegal deforestation, correct? Right. Happening here in Brazil. And this is what we need to fight here in Brazil, to fight a situation where in one side you have an agri-food sector that's fully compliant to what the clients want and what the world wants. And I would do also say that we are doing more than other countries if we follow the forest code. But we have also another part of the, of the sector that's not compliant, even with the Brazilian law, you see? Because there's no implementation of the law and there's no, in some places there's no land titles. And if, if there's no land titles, you cannot apply the law, correct? So uh, this is the situation today. And I believe that this movement after the pandemic uh, that, that's happening, uh, because Two, three years ago, this was an issue between farmers and some NGOs, environmental NGOs. Now, all the big banks, all the, all the supermarkets, all the international organizations, they are all involved with this, uh, trying to find a solution. And the solution right. comes with uh, creating zero deforestation supply chains or uh, applying the Brazilian law, land title, to see that there's a lot of things to be done here in Brazil, because as it was said by Marcelo, Brazil is a very recent country in terms of agri-food. You see, we, all our big history uh, of expansion came after the 70s. So it's very recent, and especially the North states where the Amazon is, are still a problem in terms of the, of the need to have the rule of the law and to have the implementation of the forest code, etc. So I would 
like to ask a provocative question before we dive into some of the other topics that you know um, we had laid out trade and kind of some of the exciting innovations but how do you solve that how do you solve this like land tenure issue in a way that could like because as you said there's demand in the world for sustainably grown you know products that you're producing um but the problem is not about like the demand or how to do it it's like this land issue and i guess you know yeah what are the solutions like how do you overcome this is it like a law change is it helping people you know get value in other ways from just like trying to own land that doesn't have a legal framework around it or yeah what are you seeing as as ways to address this well this is it's got to be a bit of everything okay there is no there is not a, a silver bullet to solve all the issues let's go back just a few years okay let's go back like 20 years only 20 years okay so we're talking about the year of 2000 uh, the narrative that we had in, in the tropical countries was like guys please go sustainable produce sustainably because the consumers around the world especially in the developed northern hemisphere countries are ready to have sustainable products right. and many industries start to build these sustainable platforms i would say 20 30 industries i i cannot name all of them but i could try if you want it started this 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 procedure but suddenly 10 15 years later what we found out was that this market wasn't there it wasn't there the market is still price driven price driven and you had no one that wanted to pay a little bit more no one is too much but very few buyers wanted to pay a little bit more to have a sustainable uh, product this was the the, the second uh, this was the first bad thing that happened the second one we had in the beginning of the 2000 uh, a few companies just a few companies big ones saying that by 2010, they would free their supply chain of uh, deforestation. There would be deforestation free supply chains by 2010. Mm -hmm. When we arrived in 2010, well, they said, no, we can't do it. We could not do it. So let's, let's postpone to 2020. And in between 2010 and 2020, thousands of companies around the world made the same commitment but when 2020 came alive almost 99 percent of them said well guys we could not make it so we have to postpone again and now we move to 2030 and then we come to what we call this this uh, uh, philosophical dilemma of decision is when someone in another part of the world tell you that you should do something because they need that and you move and you change you build a transformation in your country and then the same client that told you that is buying the product not from from you anymore but buying from someone else that can produce cheaper than you and this happened in the entire industry in the entire industry suddenly in the past year we had a big change in this market so the pressure is not coming from NGOs anymore that failed. As the, as the private sector failed in the last 20 years, the NGOs also failed in, in, in put their promise on. So both uh, uh, misled the promise, okay? And now we had this new big deal that is the pressure from the investment side. And mm -hmm. then we are starting to go in the right way because unfortunately this is how the world works follow the money money talks louder than anything else so when the investor says guy i'm not going to put my money in something that's not linked to sustainability anymore so you make retailers you make manufacturers you make yeah. growers to start to think about it because it's getting harder to get access to the money so yeah. 
for me, it's very disappointing to say that because it would be much more beautiful to say that consumers, companies, and people around the world understand the problems of the climate change and we want to be the better world. So let's move. But it didn't happen. But now it's starting to, to, to happen uh, faster. And this is going to be, I think, a big driver to faster change in Brazil, not only in Brazil, but in other tropical countries or, or heavy forested uh, countries yeah. worldwide. And here at Thought for Food, you know, we're really focused on the next generation of innovators and entrepreneurs. And what excites me too, um, and I'd love to hear your reactions to this. So the pressure, like you said, is now coming from investors. Um, there is this pressure, of course, from NGOs, which, I mean, has failed over the past 10 years, but it's still there, right? They want to see business be a force for good, including agribusiness. Agri um, but it's also coming from the power of innovation because innovation can help make sustainability cost effective, right? It doesn't have to be a more expensive endeavor. It can actually help, you know, increase your margins in some cases. And, you know, also look at the like true costs of things, right? Well, I'll just go to an example. I know from another part of the world in Southeast Asia, which is like, you know, palm oil production in a large part has been looking at like clearing land to grow more oil palm, but actually not the land isn't always optimized for growing that crop in the most efficient and productive way. So with digital technology, you're able to like find the best land to grow your crop, right? And, you know, find other uses for land that isn't optimized for oil palm for diversification strategies. And these are exciting, I believe, breakthroughs that will lead to win-wins for sustainability and productivity because they're not like creating losers, right? Like you can still be a successful business. <laughs> um, I do you totally see that? agree. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I what are some of the- I think happening. It's happening really fast. And I think Marcos has good examples on that because he always says about uh, today you have crops where you should have forests and we have forests where we should have crops. So maybe Marcos can, can say something about it. Yeah. Oh, Marcos, you're on mute. Uh, there Sorry. we go. I believe that the way that we had the occupation of the territory was uh, very chaotic. So we used to have a uh, cities in places where we could not have cities and <laughs> agriculture in, in, in areas that were good for forests and we have also areas good for agriculture in forests. So this is, this is a problem. We, we never had a zoning, something like that. We never had some kind of law establishing how would be the agricultural development. What we had, which was amazing, is a movement of tropical technology that made Brazil different of any other tropical country in the world. And these tropical technologies started in the hands of the universities and, 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 and the public sector. For example, Embrapa is a, is a case of a public company in Brazil doing tropical technology that made possible for soybeans to, to move from Rio Grande do Sul in the south up to the Cerrados of the Northeast, uh, close to the, to the Equator. <laughs> And then the same for cotton and for other products. So we had a lot of innovations, but we also had the good farmers. Because of the European migration to the south of Brazil, lots of small farmers that came, for example, from Italy or from Germany, like my family or many others, they were able to increase the areas, which is very important in tropical conditions. You cannot produce much commodities if you don't have economies of scale. Okay, and if you don't have the right technology, because there's much more uh, plagues and diseases in tropical conditions, it's, it's completely different. We are producing normally the whole year, not we don't have the winter to eliminate the plagues and diseases. So all these adaptations were possible here. Today we have a, a revolution with the inclusion of nanotechnologies, ge geotechnologies. There's a huge monitoring of the Amazon today. Any new deforestation in the Amazon is possible to, to immediately see where it's happening. It's not being applied to the controls as we would like to have, no Marcelo, but, but we, can, we can see very easily. 
where deforestation is happening today. We can also have certification process. We can have traceability process. Uh, we can have lots of new technologies, digital technologies that would make agriculture much more efficient here in Brazil. But there is always this issue about the, the public policies that are still needed to, to, to solve the problems in the Amazon, for example, and this starts with land tenure rights. Uh, and also we need to have uh, uh, this pressure. I think we, we are going to have now this pressure coming from the food chain. And this will change the whole equation. Because if the supermarkets, if the financiers are changing their position, uh, there's no way. You see, the companies will need to do that. And they will do. The big companies will do for sure. I'm not sure if, if, if we do. I think well, what's very risky for us is to have a system where the bigger companies uh, do their own supply chains they they organize their own supply chains but at the same time you have a leakage you see of companies or farmers to the illegal world the illegal world and then you have two systems you see happening at the same time one one that's fully fully compliant even ab above the brazilian law and another system that would be below the brazilian law <laughs> And mm -hmm. still, still needing needing control. So it's a it's not easy to say what will happen here, but I think that in general, it's a brilliant case of a country that increases food production. is is one of the main countries in the world to supply basic commodities to to to, to, to Asia to Africa. Because another thing that's very important, people normally they they listen very much what Europe and US says about sustainability. But our clients today, our big clients are in Asia. They are not any more rich countries. Today, it's China. China is buying 42% of Brazilian exports. And it started by soybeans, and now it's, it's, it's beef, it's, it's chicken, it's pork, it's, it's, it's a paper, uh, cellulose, it's, it's a cotton, it's a several products. So uh, what, what China thinks about all this, you see? So this is a big issue. And then it's, uh, also in the future, Southeast Asia, South Asia, India, Africa, you see, these are the, the regions that are really becoming the big consumers of the future, you see, in terms of quantity, in terms of the population, things like that. And is that Brazil's vision is to kind of be the exporter to these, you know, um, consumers of the future? And if so, like, what's different? Like you've mentioned some of the big companies, Cargill, you know, and others that are requesting more sustainable supply chains are the, you know, because China has a whole different set of its own importers <laughs> um, and companies. So are they de making the same demands of Brazil? It's a different demand, in my opinion. Marcelo can talk about this and also about this, this double, double uh, tracks that we have. We see large companies on one side and, uh, and companies that are not working in the that are working beyond the Brazilian law, uh, right. below the Brazilian law, correct? But uh, I believe that uh, China doesn't have the same warriors as, as Europe. You see? In Europe, there's a huge movement in, the, in, the, in, in terms of more sustainable products, less yeah. consumption in some cases. They want, for example, to consume less, less yeah. beef, for example, or sugar or things yeah. like that. But if you go Here. to Asia, these countries still have increasing consumption of, you see, meats and animal protein and sugar and other products. They have mm -hmm. problems of food security, huge problems. Look at the COVID now, you see, what's, what are the countries that are suffering from COVID in terms of you see, food? It's not Europe, it's not Brazil, it's not US, it's Africa, it's Middle East, you see. These are the regions that, that, that were touched by the yeah. pandemic. You see, we need to remember this. And also they have a food safety issues, which is a very important agenda after the pandemic, because we have a problem of you see, zoonosis here and zoonosis come from animals, yeah. domestic or you see, uh, how do you say, wild animals. And then the, the issue of sanitary conditions become very, very important too. As, as it is, uh, 
sustainable agriculture, environment, etc. I'm not saying that this is less important, but we cannot forget that this is not the only agenda. See, environment is not the only agenda. Yeah. Social issues, uh, animal welfare, sanitary conditions are as important as it is the environmental conditions. Mm, yes. Uh, Christine, if I may add, let's, let's come back a bit uh, to the investment side again. Yeah. So let's look at Kofiko. Kofiko is the biggest soybean buyer in the world, uh, Chinese uh, biggest uh, uh, soybean importer. Okay. Uh, okay. Are they being questioned by their, their clients in China in regards of sustainability? I don't know. We got to ask them. But last year, uh, they had to go to the market to get some loans. And it was a big one, 2.5 billion US dollars in mm -hmm. order to, to, to improve their operations throughout the world. Mm -hmm. But to get this, this size of money, you, you must have a consortium of banks. Not only one bank will give anyone this kind of money. So yeah. when you put all banks together, what they're doing today, they're investors. So they ask for sustainable, sustainable, sustainability returns, social and environmental speaking. Yes, G. So Kofiko, yes. So Kofiko had to make a series of commitments in order to get that money. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter if how many of their consumers locally are asking for ESG right now, but in an overall worldwide business, you have to comply with. Mm -hmm. In certain countries, you can be high than, higher than that or lower than that, mm -hmm. but you have some, some level of compliance. And when you talked about technology, about innovation, this is for Brazil is really good. We want to have as much technology as we, we can have. We want to be as many uh, satellites flying over Brazil and mapping and checking our, our food system. Because mm -hmm. there is one thing that no one can compare with us. Because of the forest code, let's take soybean, okay? The most common one, okay? So let's suppose that someone, you are in Switzerland now, so let's suppose that someone in Switzerland just imported uh, one kilogram of beans from Brazil and one kilogram of beans from the United States. In terms of beans, they are the same. They are soybeans. Chemical speaking, physically speaking, beans. Mm -hmm. What, what differs both of them? The beans from Brazil, from Central West, in every farm, 35% of that farm had to be kept on the forest reserve, which means that in a totality of that area, when you, you, you take a carbon assumption, we are exporting beans plus a certain level of, of, of carbon. Mm -hmm. negative carbon. So we are right. sequestering, uh, we are uh, uh, capping uh, 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 carbon from the atmosphere. In the United States, no. If they have one hectare of soy, it's one hectare of soy, not 75% of soy and 35% of forest preserve. The second yeah. point is 90% uh, of the Brazilian energy is renewable. In the United States, much less than that because they're still using coal and so on. So in the end of the day, when you do the balance, our beans is much more sustainable than, than the beans overall. And I, I, I like to say to the people that the, the agribusiness in Brazil is, is so professional right now that's being able to produce two crops uh, per year in a very sustainable way. But the most important crop is, in a, is yet not in place, but it's coming. And I call the third crop of carbon. And when we start to talk about carbon and food and the link between carbon and food, we're gonna be unbeatable. We're gonna be unbeatable in terms of food production compared with this scale of sustainability, which is our problem that we have to solve is the illegality that continues to deforest the Amazon region. This is not yeah. done by business. This is done by criminals, by illegals. So we have to, to put pressure 
on the, the federal government. We still have to put pressure on the state government and also put pressure at, uh, over the Brazilian society because this is something that we have to, to solve it yeah. for, 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 for all. We have to solve it. So uh, as I used to tell my colleagues, please, let's not launch a marketing campaign in Europe on the US. On the US. We don't have to, to spend any money on marketing campaign. We have to give them a concrete action. And our concrete action is the reduction of the illegal deforestation. Without the deforestation, we're going to be uh, unbeatable in the market. And then we have to talk about uh, competition because competition is not a healthy thing. People don't like to, 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 to put good leverage on top of their competitors. So it's, it's a different word, but it's a different topic for another conversation. I mean, that's super exciting to hear. I mean, I've definitely, in all of my conversations, been hearing so much about carbon markets and agriculture and how this is the next frontier. It's very complex, though, from what I understand, like how to measure it, you know, what's real, does it last in the soil and more. But like you have, like you said, um, much going for you because you have the crops, the forests, and the soils, right? Like all which can play um, an integral role in sequestering carbon um, and give you a competitive edge. So I really love this comparison of the hectare of soy from Brazil, like, and basically, uh, you know, it's leader, leading position in the market of sustainability and, you know, product uh, profile. So um, it's a really, I feel like though there is just a lot of misunderstanding about Brazil. Like I do think with a lot of the media coverage of late and a lot of the kind of, yeah, ethos in a large part of the world, like Europe and the United States, there's this perception that, you know, Brazil is just kind of going all in on monocultures and deforestation, you know, to, to get this export advantage. And it's really fascinating to hear the nuance behind this. Um, can you tell me a couple of more like stories um, and, you know, examples of kind of Brazil's leadership in transforming agricultural systems um, towards something that can be kind of a North Star for the world and for other countries that are in the tropics going through this transition, you know, to become agricultural producers and potentially exporters? Uh, Marcos. Uh, yes, um, I believe that the, the whole story for Brazil, in one side we have the most important and mythical forest of the world, correct? The Amazon is something completely uh, you see, in the in the heads and in the minds of of everyone in the world, every child in every in in every school, yeah. uh, and we are still seeing deforestation in the Amazon. So this is as you see, it was said by Marcelo. It's it's an issue to be solved by the Brazilians, mm -hmm. and it's not from this government. You see, people say, "Ah, oh, no, this is the the current government." No, it's it's a twenty thirty years problem. Uh, that comes from the occupation of this region and and the illegal deforestation. See, people in other countries they don't understand what's illegal. What's illegal here in Brazil means that it's a huge country, and in some places of, of Brazil you don't have control of what what's happening there. And we are not the only country that do not have control. You see, even today rich countries are not controlling some situations. So. Uh, we needed to do our, our homework in this area. But when we look at the agri-food sector, then we have all these stories. You see, we have the, the energy matrix. It's very clean in Brazil because we are not only using a lot of water, wind and solar today, but we have also biofuels in Brazil that are more, yeah. more used than every other country. Mm -hmm. And we are using in a very efficient way because we have flex fuel cars, we have the, uh, 25 blend of gas of ethanol into gasoline. We have 10 to 15 blend of biodiesel in diesel. So more than any other country. Yeah. We have biomass you pr producing electricity. We have a transportation system that's changing very quickly. I just heard. Uh, I I just r wrote a piece about the transformation of Brazil from roads to railways. Right now, it's happening very fast. Brazil is doing in this decade 
what uh, other big countries like US, Australia, and others, or, or Canada did 50 years ago or 80 years ago, we are doing now, we are investing a lot in new railroads and also waterways. And this is a way to save carbon and to save accidents, to see, have less accidents in the roads and things like that, to see public policy, etc. We also have a more photosynthesis than other countries because we are in tropical conditions. We can produce the whole year. We have the legal reserves. We don't have much irrigation yet because we have a very beautiful rainy season that allow us to produce two or three crops a year. So this kind of uh, uh, thing is we need to really discuss this with the world because we've been discussing internally, but Marcel and me, we are two guys that we say all the time, we need to have a dialogue about this. You see, it's not a confrontation. It's not us versus that, you see? <laughs> Uh, but it's a, it's a, it's it's a kind of dialogue like we are having today. You see, it's a question of you see showing where are uh, the big uh, you see uh, conquests of the country, but also mm -hmm. the big threats we have today, like like the Amazon situation. You see, mm -hmm. and we cannot deny that we have problems in the Amazon, but we we should work together as Brazilians to solve this this very old problem of occupation. I think as Brazilians and as a global community, because like you said, like the Amazon is so like meaningful to everyone around the world and, you know, the lungs of the planet and everything. So it's like we all have a vested interest, right, in helping Brazil kind of achieve this vision. Um, so before I get to the, the question I want to ask, I just want to see Marcelo, like it looked like you had a response too. So I want to give you a moment to, to respond and speak too. No, I, I just wanted to mention something that is more, it's more political related to, to the actual days, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, we do have a government now that uh, is not really famous uh, worldwide. <laughs> uh, the same as other many countries, okay? Like where my but here, we, <laughs> Okay, so, so here we're not talking about governments, we're talking mm -hmm. about countries. We're talking about state level, not about government level. So whenever it's happened here today, it's, it's happening because we live in a democratic country and this guy was elected by the majority of the voters uh, some time ago, the same in the US, the same in the UK, the same wherever in the world. So what we must pay attention as a citizens is in the next election, if we see that things were not done correctly, we have to change the chance to change, but democratically speaking. So I'm not in favor how they're dealing with the environment in Brazil today. Actually, I'm totally against the environmental policies of the, the, the actual right. government. But I have two options to do. I can sit with them and deal with and negotiate and try to do something better. Or I can go home and sit for the next two and a half years and do nothing. Right. And this is not the case as, as, as a positive citizenship who knows what I have to do to my country, well, me and Marcos and millions of Brazilians. Even those guys who voted for, for the guy there, okay, I voted, but I don't agree with that. Yeah. So if we have something bad going on right now, it's not forever. It's something that is happening right now and always can give us a chance to change. Like the, the, the deforestation started to, to raise again in 2012, and we are in 2020. So in eight years, we could not solve the problem. Yeah. I think now we are building something good throughout the Amazon Council. And I still believe that for the coming year, we, we're gonna start to see some reduction, at least for the first time ever, we're gonna have uh, targets, deforestation redu reduction targets. At least mm -hmm. this was, uh, uh, I was told by the vice president of Brazil in a meeting we had two, two weeks ago. So I'm positive that we're gonna solve this, but it's not gonna be like 
like this. It's going to take well, a while, exactly. unfortunately. Nothing ever is, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Which I want to lead with, lead with a final question. But before I do, I just wanted to say you really highlighted something that's core to like our TFF approach to change making, which is kind of, you know, we have to default towards action and not complacency. And when we're solving big and complex challenges, such as those facing our food system, that big question, how do we feed 10 billion people by 2050? There's so many different shades of gray within that big question. And how do you, you know, um, get to the rich innovation opportunities that lay in that spectrum of, you know, between the poles, right? The polarized positions. We basically take an approach that's based on step one, find the nuance. So when you're facing a big and complex issue like deforestation, like don't just take the position as, you know, that you read in the media as the, the case that is the final, you know, um, jury outcome. Like go out, talk to people, understand the different interests, right, behind these issues and the nuance and the, the like I said, the richness of why people are thinking and acting in the way they are. The second uh, modality of action that we go towards is how to flip dilemmas, how to take things that look like polarization and turn them into win-win scenarios wherever possible. So turn dilemmas into opportunities wherever possible. And the third one is you can do that by building bridges, right? So really embracing these like human characteristics of empathy and openness, and vulnerability even to say like we're here towards finding solutions not fighting for a particular point of view because where does that get us if i'm just going to stand steadfast in my position it doesn't lead towards a positive outcome for anyone so it's about building bridges of support and understanding and all of those things just take time so that's why we can't snap our fingers in tff land but that's what we're here to do is to bring all of these different players together to understand each other to find find innovation opportunities that, you know, are going to turn dilemmas into opportunities and to build bridges between generations, between countries, between points of view and more. That's how we're going to change the food system. That's at least TFF's position. But the question I wanted to leave with was, what advice do you have? We have a community of 30,000 young people in 175 countries who really, really care about not just talking about these topics, but actually doing something about them. So what advice do you have? What books do you think we should be reading? What should we be doing? You know, with the last, you know, five, six minutes we have, we'd love to hear your expertise imparted onto the young people over the world. Uh, Who should start? My, uh, my, See, it comes from the from the agenda of uh, Thoughts for Food Foundation, yeah? which is uh, how to feed 10 billion people in 2050, correct? I believe that the big problem is not uh, to save the Amazon or to save the Indian communities or or the role of the of Brazilian agriculture. This is part of a much broader question: is that we have we still have an explosion of, of uh, birth, you see, uh, new people, uh, population in areas like Africa and South, Bay, South, South Asia, you see, Indian countries like that. These countries, they have today uh, 3 billion people, Africa and South Asia, they go to 5 billion people in 2050, they go to 7 billion people in, in 2000, in, in see, 2100. So, uh, this is the problem. See how to feed all these people that's coming. The models of technology they have today, especially in Africa, uh, are very poor, are, are very low productivity. So how to how to increase productivity? First of all, you see, then you you have the emerging economies, mm -hmm. uh, Middle East, China, Southeast Asia. You see lots of countries that are increasing per capita incomes and increasing urbanization very very fast. So this is the the huge problem. It's, it's first, we we have a huge population. We have especially huge population in emerging economies, and they will need food. Correct? Food is basic for any pre, any peace process in the world. So 
coming from this question, we needed to save resources. And then we needed to have good technologies. The first way to save resources is to increase productivity by far. If we don't increase the agricultural productivity, we will not save the forest. Second, we needed to have territorial approaches and we needed to, to, to take the Amazon as, as a case to do the right things in the right places there, which is a big place. It's 50% it's of the country, but, but we needed to, there are several Amazons. So let's work very deeply on the Amazon. Let's work with new technologies like certification. Uh, yeah. uh, digital certification, traceability. Traceability is extremely important to do uh, zero deforestation supply chain. For example, here in Brazil, the two crops, the two activities that we need to work is basically beef and soy. And beef much more than soy because soy is, is much easier to do traceability. Mm. But beef is very complicated because the, the, the animals are moving from one farm to the other. You see 80% is for the domestic market. It's, it's much more complicated. So let, let's do the case. Let's do a case for, for beef. Let's succeed in this, because if we succeed in beef here in Brazil, we will have, a, uh, uh, I think, a big solution, you see. And let's work on the ESG. That all companies are now working, you see. And ESG means environmental, social, and governance. And we needed to remember that if we only think about environment, we are not doing the social. That's right. right. So there is an interaction between these three letters. And this is very difficult, like it is in sustainability to consider the economic, the social, and the, and the environmental. See? So now we are talking about governance, but governance means that you need to, to find a, an equilibrium in this, in this equation. So this is, these are the big challenges. And, and my recommendation to do this is first, having good data. If we don't have good data, we cannot start any conversation. If right. we have wrong data, uh, this, is, this is the way to not do things. And the second one, dialogue, international dialogue. You see, it's not confrontation. The world today has too, too much polarization. All these social networks are a disaster of polarization. So let's try to find the right places to have a, a dialogue, a productive dialogue. Yeah. Data and dialogues. Um, yeah. What about you, Marcelo? Well, he just left one thing for me because all the rest he already said. But mm -hmm. I would like to add, uh, we have to act responsibly, especially these 30,000 young people who are watching us or, or, or following you. Yeah responsibility on losses, on losses. The food sector worldwide accounts for 8 trillion US dollars, 8 trillion US dollars. Right. Where 30% of that, or 2.4 trillion US dollars, are lost every year in parts of the supply chain. When we look at the rich countries, the biggest losses comes between the supermarket and the household and your, your home, okay? When you look at undeveloped countries, the biggest losses are in between the production and the processing plants. So it's, it's a logistical uh, problem. But how can we live in a world where we throw in the garbage 2.4 trillion US dollars per year and this happens for one reason, because we put too much attention on environment, too much attention on social, but never the right attention on governance. So if the environmental issues are not working, if the social issues are not working, it's because the governance in that place never worked. So the things we have to do right now, and we have to act responsibly and calling for responsibility for everyone involved is governance. Without the proper governance, we're not going to change environment and social issues. I love this. I mean, if I, I maybe it's too um, close to say this, but we could make it a third D if we said democracy. But yeah, we have data, we have dialogues, and we have governance. <laughs> I was trying to get a 3D thing going on there, but that's 
Fantastic advice, very thought provoking session. Um, I would love to continue the discussions. I mean, if you have like, do you have one or two more minutes? Because we did get a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd love to take it if you don't mind, which is from Rafael Souza who says, how do you see the roles of the whole sector, I guess the whole agribusiness sector to change the image of our agribusiness for the world since this is not being done by the current and past government? Well, as I see, it's our responsibility as well. Uh, as the head of the, the Brazilian Agribusiness Association right now, this is my biggest task, is to work on top of this. Uh, I believe most of the people in the sector agree with me, uh, a few of them not. And it, it's more a political issue than a real sustainable issue. But mm -hmm. I, I do not extract or I do not leave behind the responsibility of the sector in also uh, to build a, an environment to help the image of the brand Brazil all over the world. Yeah, I, will, I would just add that the, we have challenges in terms of the image and the, and the first challenge is because countries, supply countries like Brazil or demand countries like China, for example, they are not well known in the world, you see. We all did our studies in the US on a, or in Europe. Marcelo did in the US, me too. Uh, I lived in the US and Europe many years. And, and this, is, this was the world for everybody during my generation, you see, going to US and Europe. Now I just lived this four years in Asia, going to China several times. And this is so hard, so difficult to understand the culture, the way they do things. And I think the same happens to Brazil. People do not know very much what's Brazil. You see, beyond the, the Amazon and soccer and, and, and the Samba, there's, there's not much information about Brazil. So the first thing to do is, is, is to really have good data and good dialogue. Because if, if people misunderstand the, the reality, the facts, you cannot do anything. You, see? you need to, first of all, show the facts. You see? And then discuss the solution. So if we, if we are going to solve ESG, okay, and the companies are investing on that, this is, this is an invitation for dialogue, you see, because the question is how to feed the 10 billion people. This is not a Brazilian problem. This is a world problem. How to save the big forest, you see? So I think that we need to really uh, get at the bigger questions and try to, to find the right answers through a dialogue system, through a, a system of transparency and conversation. Wonderful. So I want to send a special thanks to everyone. We had huge participation in tonight's session. I see that Marcello has put his contact information into the chat. Um, Marcos, uh, if you'll free to do so. Otherwise, anyone can contact me at any time, Christine at thoughtforfood.org to you know, follow up with any questions that you have or topics that you would like for future sessions. I definitely think that we could do a whole series just on Brazil, agriculture, and you know, the future. So I'd love to stay in close contact with both of you um, for you know, all of the stuff that we discussed today um, and more. So thank you humbly on behalf of Thought for Food, our audience, you know, um, and we're excited to continue the dialogue and you know, to play our role in catalyzing action and innovation around these challenges, um, but really appreciate it. And thank you so much. Stay safe and healthy, and we will be in touch soon. Likewise, thank you. Bye-bye. Likewise. Bye -bye. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a great conversation. Bye-bye. Ciao, Marcelo. Abraço. Ciao, Marcos.